and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I am your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Melissa Urban. She is one of the co-founders of The Whole 30. If you know what that is, then you know what that is. And if you don't, you're going to learn what that is in this conversation. Briefly, it is a way of thinking about eating for 30 days that changes your relationship with food, puts a boundary in place, helps you to assess and remove certain items from it as well as grow and learn through that process. I've done it. I know many others who have. It's been very beneficial. And then we talk about her brand new book, The Book of Boundaries, Set the Limits That Will Set You Free. We talk about what a boundary is, why it's important to set them, what the three steps of setting boundaries are, and what's the difference between, say, a boundary or an ultimatum, and why they're important for us, not just for relationships with people in our lives, but also situations and things that we're much better off and healthier setting boundaries because it involves a prioritization and an amount of pre-thinking that then alleviates in-the-moment thinking having to happen as much. I really enjoyed this conversation with Melissa, and I know you are as well. So I'll just get out of the way and say enjoy this conversation with Melissa Urban. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show Melissa Urban. Melissa, welcome to Beyond the To-Do List. Hi, Eric. Thanks so much for having me. So I was excited to learn about your new book, but not just for the topic of it, but then to find out a little bit more about who you are. And I think that's probably the best place to start. Some people may actually know you before hearing about your new book because you're the founder of Whole30. So would you mind maybe explaining to the few people who've probably not heard of it? Let's do a quick summary for those that haven't. Okay, for sure. So the Whole30 is a 30-day self-experiment designed to help you identify food sensitivities change your habits and your emotional relationship with food. So it's not a diet. It's not a weight loss plan. It's not a detox or a cleanse. For 30 days, you'll eliminate foods that are commonly problematic in one of four categories, your cravings and emotional relationship with food, your metabolism and blood sugar regulation, your digestion and your immune system and inflammation. So you're going to pull foods out for 30 days and see what happens. What happens to your energy, your sleep, your cravings, your digestion, your aches and pains, your allergies, asthma, and migraines, all of those things can be deeply impacted by the food you're eating, even the stuff you might think is healthy. At the end of the 30 days, you'll reintroduce those foods back into your diet one at a time, like a scientific experiment, and compare your experience. And so through the Whole30, you'll be able to take what you've learned and create the perfect sustainable diet for you based on how foods work in your individual system. Perfect. Disclosure, I have done a Whole30 before and my family as well. I know close friends as well as acquaintances who've done it and all have had some benefit after they've done it. What are some of the stories that you've heard? Oh, my goodness. You know, the Whole30 has been around since 2009, so it's been 13 years at this point, and we've got hundreds of thousands of testimonials. You know, just the other day, someone wrote to me and said, my doctor could not figure out what was going on with my digestion, my skin issue, my headaches, and I did a Whole30, and I figured out that it was a gluten sensitivity. I don't have celiac. They did the test for that, but I'm sensitive to gluten in other ways that lab testing didn't show up, and now... Thanks to my Whole30, I just avoid gluten and I can avoid all of those negative side effects. I hear stories like that every single day. And then we've got incredible stories from people who their doctor prescribed Whole30 to them and they're no longer diabetic, like type 2 diabetic. So it really runs the gamut. You don't have to be sick to try the Whole30. But I think what the Whole30 does is helps you identify exactly the foods that work best for you and lets you make an educated and informed decision about where and how often and when to consume them in a way that fits your life. So then the book title, The Book of Boundaries, Set the Limits That Will Set You Free, didn't really surprise me once I learned that you were the person who founded Whole30 <laughs> because Whole30 is essentially a temporary and limited boundary on your diet for a specific reasoning. And then, you know, I feel like this is kind of partly the story of how you became the air quotes, the boundary lady. 
It is. It really is. You know, because the Whole30 is based on this framework of an elimination diet, you do eliminate all of these food groups 100% by the book. And, you know, doctors will tell you elimination diets have to be completed strictly in order to be effective. So you say no a lot on the Whole30 during those 30 days to the break room donuts or the pizza at the birthday party or the offer of wine at happy hour. And people have a hard time saying no, especially in social settings. So I would help people say no to all of those occasions during their Whole30. And once they realized I was really good at helping them say no in those circumstances, they started coming to me talking about their nosy neighbor, their pushy coworker, their toxic mother-in-law. And asking me how to help them say no or set boundaries in those situations as well. So the book of boundaries is a very natural kind of outgrowth of the work I've been doing with Whole30 for over a decade. Now, we've given some context here, but let's be specific and even give a definition to Mm -hmm. the word boundary. How do you define that? Yeah, you know, I think the word often just makes people feel icky, you know, in general. And I think there are a lot of misconceptions about boundaries. So. I define boundaries as limits that you place around how other people are allowed to engage with you. So they're not about controlling other people's behavior. They're not about telling other people what to do or keeping them at arm's distance. Boundaries are essentially you telling other people what you are willing to do to keep yourself safe and healthy and to improve the relationship. They're an invitation to the people in your life to say, hey, I want the way that we engage to feel good for both of us. And here is a limit that I've identified that would help make our relationship feel more trusting, more respectful, more free. It would eliminate dread or anxiety or resentment I'm having. And if you're willing to meet me in that limit, our relationship can be freer and happier and more comfortable than ever. So it sounds like a boundary doesn't have to be limiting. It can be limiting towards freedom, hence the limits that will set you free subtitle. Yeah. You know, when you think about boundaries, I think I used to think about boundaries as, oh, keeping other people away from me and they're going to make my life smaller. And really, boundaries are about freeing yourself from the resentment, the anxiety, the dread, the mistrust. The stress that you have in certain situations or certain relationships where you think about engaging with the coworker who's always emotionally dumping on you or always gossiping about other coworkers. And, and you just feel this sense of dread every time they walk by your cube or pop in to say hello. If a simple boundary around those conversation topics were successful, you would no longer have to feel that. You would no longer dread the relationship. You would be free to have a relationship with this coworker in a way that felt so much healthier to you. So boundaries can be healthy. And in fact, we do need them. I'm thinking, you know, what are some real life boundaries that people take for granted as actual boundaries? Like, you know, the solid lines on the road, right? Like there's a reason they're there. It's so that we don't run into each other. It's having guardrails on highways where it doesn't, you know, let you sail off the edge and things like that. Putting boundaries up is a good thing. And in fact, it's almost related to not getting too much of a good thing. You know, there are certain things that are good things, but once you overindulge in them for better or for worse, you know, even temporarily, but if you do it all the time, it ends up being something that just kind of wrecks you. Yeah. I mean, let's put that into a very practical standpoint. Your in-laws want to come for a visit and they say, we want to come and we want to spend 10 days with you as soon as the baby is born. That does not feel healthy. That does not feel sustainable to me. I and my spouse want time alone at home to bond with the baby. So I'm going to set up a guardrail, a boundary around how they engage with my family when my baby is born in a way that feels healthy for both of us. So maybe it's a boundary around you can absolutely come for 10 days, but we can't have you stay at the house. Let me help you find an Airbnb or a hotel nearby. Or you can absolutely come stay but you can't come right away. We want at least two weeks at home to bond with the baby before any visitor. So please plan your visit later. Or you are absolutely welcome to stay, but you can only stay for three nights. That's what we have the capacity for. Any one of those boundaries is essentially saying, I want you in my life and I want to keep this relationship healthy, but too much of a good thing, which is this relationship with my parents or in-laws, 
is not going to be healthy for either of us. So I'm going to establish this healthy limit in a way that works for us to preserve the relationship and preserve my mental health. Exactly. So the other thing is, is that we've kind of been programmed to say yes to pretty much everything and fill all of our time with constant stimulus. So it seems like this current time we're living in means we need more boundaries, not less. But in fact, we're using less or putting less in place. Yes. And didn't the pandemic just bring that all to a head? All of a sudden, our work and our kids and our school and our spouse and families and housework all bled together into one big hot mess. And so many of us, especially moms, did not have boundaries in place to be able to set healthy limits around our personal time, around work time, around our mental health, our energy, our capacity. So the pandemic, I think, really highlighted all of the ways in which we need these healthy limits to preserve our own capacity so that we can show up for other people in our life, our kids, our spouse, our job, our friends, and ourselves in a way that feels healthy and sustainable. So somebody listening in right now is thinking, okay, this makes sense to me, but how do I know when I need to set a boundary with a specific thing? Like, What are some of the warning signs? So this general sense of like ickiness is a prime red flag. If you feel a sense of dread, anxiety, or stress, or you are avoiding a certain person, a certain conversation topic, a time of day or a location, like I said, if every time this coworker walks by your desk, you pretend to look really busy, or every time you see your mother-in-law's name pop up on your phone, you immediately hit decline. Or you think about going to your family's house for dinner and you just know they are going to pressure you to drink alcohol or pick apart what's on your plate or what isn't on your plate. Those are all prime signs that a boundary is needed. If you feel like you can't show up as your full self with somebody, if you feel like you have to kind of make yourself small, if somebody tells you that their feelings are more important than yours or hints at that fact... If you leave an interaction and you're running through all of these things in your head, what I could have said, what I should have said, why didn't I say no? Why didn't I stick up for myself? Those are all prime signals that a boundary is needed. Okay. So say somebody has sensed that ickiness and they've said, okay, I definitely have a need and a want because you probably need both of those things, an awareness of a need, but then also a desire for a, a want to set the boundary, right? Because you, yeah. you, you, you may know you need it, but you may think, I don't know if I can do it. And that's kind of the next step, right? It's like, well, wait a second. If you feel it's hard, how then do you start to begin the process? I know you have three steps for creating boundaries. Yeah, the first step is identifying that you need a boundary. So we've already talked about that. I think there are a number of signals that can say, you know, okay, I need a boundary here, whether it's with somebody else or with myself. The second step is to actually set the boundary. And this is the part that I think feels really scary for people. And I'm not going to lie, it is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to advocate for your own needs. It's uncomfortable to rescind a privilege that someone has become used to having. It's uncomfortable to say, my needs matter too in this relationship. And to know that your boundary is perhaps going to make someone disappointed or upset or uncomfortable themselves. Yes, it's uncomfortable. But I will point out that what you are doing now is equally uncomfortable. Swallowing your feelings, feeling resentment, feeling anxiety, the dread you feel around these interactions, avoiding this person, not enjoying your time together, fuming to yourself after they leave, all of that is uncomfortable too. And only one of those paths leads to actual change that improves your health and improves the relationship. And that is the setting of the boundary. It does get easier with time. And one of the things I've focused on in the book is offering practical scripts. Literally, here is what you say. If you need to set a boundary with your mother-in-law who is constantly stopping by without calling first, or the coworker who's always gossiping, or the person who's always pressuring you to drink, here's exactly how you say it. Because I think in the moment, it can be hard to find the words. Interesting. Yeah. Speaking of the words, you talk a lot about using specific language or an approach of clear and kind language when you're setting boundaries. What do you mean by that? So clear is kind is a phrase from Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead. 
it so perfectly frames my boundary philosophy that I wrote to her. And I was like, hey, can I use this in my book? And she said, absolutely go for it. So when we think about setting boundaries, I think sometimes it's so uncomfortable that we want to get away with just hinting about them. Maybe it's an eye roll. Maybe it's making a face. Maybe it's laughing uncomfortably. Maybe it's just our body language. And we are desperately hoping that the other person gets the hint that what happened is not okay. Your mother-in-law shows up again without calling. You open the door slowly. Hey, Barb, how are you? And you're hoping that they're going to get the hint that, oh no, I'm shut up on the porch and I have it cold and that's not okay. None of that is actually setting a boundary. And honestly, it's not very kind because we're asking the people in our lives to guess at what we need and maybe even to read our minds. And that's not fair, nor is it effective. So when I say use clear, kind language in your boundary, you have to actually set the boundary in a way that is clear. This is a need and I am expressing this need to you clearly, but you also have to be kind. It's not, Barb, if you don't call, I'm not answering the door again and you slam the door. That's not very kind. And that doesn't really account for the fact that you want to preserve this relationship in a way that works for both of you. So Clear, kind language is kind of at the foundation of what I talk about when I talk about boundaries. Yeah, and what you just described there basically comes across as an ultimatum, and that's not the same as a boundary. Yeah, you know, sometimes a boundary can include a consequence or even an ultimatum. If I've clearly expressed my limit, Eric, we don't allow smoking in the house. Would you please put that cigarette out or go outside? And the 10th time you come over and try to light up a cigarette, I might say to you, Eric, if you don't put that cigarette outside, I'm going to escort you out myself. Or unfortunately, you're not going to be invited to my house again. That feels like an ultimatum, but I have prefaced it with a number of boundary conversations where I'm saying, I don't allow smoking in my house because it makes me cough. My son is allergic. I don't like the way it smells. That is my healthy limit. And I have invited you to meet me in that limit. If you refuse and you purposefully decide to be disrespectful, then yes, there will be a consequence. And the consequence is the action I will take to ensure that you don't continue to cause harm, which is I will not invite you to my house again. But we don't start there. I don't start with that when you pull out the cigarette for the very first time and I go, get out of my house or you're never coming back because that's not a kind way to share a limit. And this brings me back to the clear and kind language, because when you were talking about that, it really came across as the way a lot of people end up creating I would say non-concrete and almost pseudo boundaries and not being clear about it, just being passive aggressive in that same scenario where I'm coming over and I'm lighting up a cigarette, which would never happen. But (laughs) if it did, you kind of passive aggressively addressing it and just acting put out and uncomfortable without being clear about the what and the why behind it seems like. If every time I would do that, you would give me the passive aggressive warning, then you jump to the ultimatum because you think that you've already done the legwork. I'm describing what most people end up doing when it comes to creating boundaries or so they think. Yes, exactly. So you lay up a cigarette at my house and I go (laughs) and I go in the other room. That's not setting a boundary. And if I do that three or four times in a row, I think... I'm being perfectly clear that I don't like smoking in my house, but I never said it. And you're not a mind reader. How are you supposed to know that that is a limit that I have set for myself and my own home? So by the fifth time it happens, I explode at you. And I say, get out of my house. You're never coming back. You're like, what the heck did I do? And now all of a sudden our relationship is fractured because I did not express my needs clearly or kindly. I didn't even give you the opportunity to respect my limit because you didn't know what was there in the first place. Sortly is the number one rated inventory management app. Track and manage your business's inventory, supplies, materials, parts, tools, equipment, and anything else that helps your business run. Sortly can be used on any device, mobile, desktop, tablet, and syncs automatically across all users and devices. Update inventory seamlessly and in real time with your whole team. It's perfect for businesses with multiple locations. Track every detail about your items as they move across your business. Location, quantity, cost, condition, and any 
other custom detail you choose. You can even set custom low stock alerts to remind you when it's time to reorder and ensure you never run out of stock. And thanks to Sortly's in-app barcode scanner, you can create a barcode or QR code system for your entire inventory right from your smartphone. No extra equipment required. Save your business time and money by ditching spreadsheets and switching to Sortly. Go to Sortly.com slash beyond for 40% off the advanced or ultra plans your first year. That's Sortly.com slash beyond for 40% off your first year. Hey, I want to tell you about Kachava, my all-in-one daily super blend. If you're worried you aren't getting all the nutrients you need or struggling to stay on top of your health and reach your optimal productivity, then listen up because Kachava has you covered. Kachava puts everything your body needs in one glass so you can have it all. All the superfoods, all the vitamins, all the omegas, all the adaptogens, all the greens, all the protein, all the benefits for your gut, your skin, your hair, your brain, your muscles, your heart, your whole health. No more compromise. No more guilt. No other nutrition shake does all this. They traveled to the ends of the earth to source them all and crush it up. Kachava is a powder you take two scoops, just add water, blend it up, and it tastes incredible. They have five delicious flavors. Chocolate and chai are my personal favorites, and I drink Kachava for breakfast, as well as an early evening curve my cravings kind of a snack. And one, it tastes amazing, and it's quick and easy for breakfast, so that I don't have to think about that when I'm busy getting everybody else out of the house in the morning. I feel energized and focused. Fulfilled. And there's just no way I could get all those nutrients in with my normal diet. Trying to manage all the supplements and ingredients you should be taking, it's it's overwhelming and expensive. But now, Kachava makes clean, organic, superfood nutrition accessible to everyone. You've got to try Kachava for yourself. Kachava is offering 10% off for a limited time. Go to kachava.com slash beyond, spelled K-A-C-H. AVA and get 10% off your first order. That's K A C H A V A dot com slash beyond. Kachava is perfect for people busy and on the go and can't find time to get all the best nutrients in their diet to give and sustain your energy. We all know that we need professional help for our mental health, and luckily it's become less stigmatized, but there are still a lot of little barriers we allow to be excuses, like scheduling and travel time and waiting time, being out of your comfort zone, and then opening up and talking. All of that can be exhausting, but by using Talkspace, it feels a little like having a therapist in your pocket. That's why being able to reach out to my therapist or psychiatrist anytime from anywhere makes taking care of my mental health super easy. I'm more relaxed when I'm traveling, knowing if I need to talk with my therapist, I can just send a message wherever I am. Working through things in therapy can be tough, but connecting with my therapist isn't. I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace for therapy. You can sign up online and start therapy the same day you sign up. You can text, video, or send voice messages to your licensed therapist. So it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions from the comfort of your home. Talkspace has thousands of licensed therapists with years of experience in over 40 specialties, including depression, anxiety, substance abuse, trauma, anger management, relationship issues, food and eating, and more. And as a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, you just go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code LIST, L-I-S-T, to get $100 off your first month and show support for the show. That's L-I-S-T, LIST, and Talkspace.com. Now, say you've done all these steps properly. You were clear. You were kind. Maybe you gave somebody the warning over and over again, and you get to that point What do we do if somebody just continues to break through those boundaries, even if we've gone through it the right way? Yeah. So this is a really important distinction. I've mentioned boundaries are not about controlling other people's behavior. However, sometimes respecting your boundary does require someone else's communication. So if I share a clear kind boundary with, you know, my mother-in-law, Oh, hey, Judy, you know, it's not always convenient for you just to drop by without calling. We can't always stop what we're doing. The kids and I both find it disruptive. Can you please call before you come over? Give us like an hour's notice. That would be so helpful. Thank you. That is a limit that you are setting, which is I will not receive visitors without appropriate notice. But what you are doing is you are issuing a request, an invitation, a clear, kind, gentle invitation to say, I have this limit. Maybe you didn't realize I had it. I'm going to express it clearly and I'm going to ask you to meet me in the middle. Most of the time, the person's going to go, yeah, sure, no problem. If it gets to the place where 
Judy continues to stop by without knocking, which is rude, by the way, because I have asked for something that is completely reasonable. Then I need to decide what are the actions that I can take to keep myself safe and healthy. I can't keep Judy from showing up on my porch, but I cannot answer the door. And that might feel harsh to people. But remember that Judy has had multiple opportunities to meet my healthy limit because I have already expressed them clearly and kindly. If she continues to make the choice to disrespect them, that I'm the one that has to take the action that I need to hold the boundary. And that might be simply not answering the door if you don't call first. I think the other thing here that might be a possible misconception, in fact, let's pause there. What are some of the misconceptions that people have as far as boundaries go? I think a very common one is, as I just said, people think boundaries are controlling someone else's behavior. So, you know, when I say, please don't smoke in the house, I'm not saying you shouldn't smoke cigarettes. I'm not saying you should quit smoking. I'm not saying don't smoke in anybody's house. What I'm saying is I don't allow smoking in my house. That is my purview. I have control over who I allow in and out of my house. That is something that I can hold. So boundaries are always about the self. They are not about telling other people what to do. They're also not mean. I think people, especially women, think of healthy boundaries as mean or punitive. And they're not. They really come from the self and thinking about my own needs and the fact that my own needs and comfort are just as important as someone else's. And I should not always have to sacrifice my needs or my comfort because someone else asks me to. Boundaries are not mean. They are, again, a healthy limit designed to preserve the relationship. So I think that's where some of the guilt comes from when we set a boundary. We kind of automatically feel guilty, like we've done something wrong. But if you think about boundaries as a gift, they're a way of saying, hey, I'm not going to make you read my mind. I'm not going to make you guess at how you can be a good friend or a good romantic partner or a good neighbor. I'm going to tell you exactly how you can show up for me in a way that really works for both of us. That's a gift. That level of clear, kind communication and expectation setting creates safety in a relationship and a real sense of trust. And you've listed off a number of these different relationships that we have, whether it's a spouse or family or uh, kids or parents or coworkers or friends. But there is one other person that can be difficult to work with when it comes to boundaries, and, and that's ourselves. <laughs> and so I'm curious if there's any different way of starting and or maintaining boundaries when it comes to that relationship with boundaries and ourselves. Yes. Self-boundaries are an often overlooked category. And I'm so glad you brought it up because the good news is that there is such tremendous power in setting and holding boundaries with yourself. It is one thing that you can do literally right now, immediately, that can have tremendous positive impact on your energy, time, physical space, mental health, such tremendous power because you're the only one who needs to agree to hold them. You don't have to require anyone else's cooperation. It doesn't have to be uncomfortable to set them. You're doing it for your highest good. The bad news is that if you choose to disregard your own boundary, like what's going to happen? Nobody's going to swoop in and slap your hand or fine you or maybe even know that you chose to disregard your boundary. So it can be challenging for us to think about how to set them up and how to hold them. But when I think about self-boundaries, and I think that one of the most important self-boundaries that I've set in my own life is I don't look at my phone before I finish my morning routine. I am not on email. I am not on Slack. I don't check social media before I finish my morning routine. And that routine can take 15 minutes or it can take an hour. It depends on my day. But I've set that boundary with myself and it helps me start the day feeling proactive instead of reactive. I get these really important things like my workout or a little meditation or breakfast with my son. I get them done in a peaceful and grounded environment. It sets me up for success for the entire day. So when I think about how do I hold this boundary with myself, it would be very easy in the morning to roll over, pick up my phone and check email. Nobody would know, except when I think about the freedoms that holding this boundary will bring to future me all of a sudden, everything becomes more clear. If I hold this boundary, I will be free to have the morning 
that I dictate, not dictated by anybody else. I will be free to complete my workout, have a leisurely breakfast without feeling stressed or triggered about what's going on at work. I will be free to start my day on my own terms, to have a happier mood, to have more energy throughout the day. And if I don't hold this boundary, I run the risk of sending my entire day sideways because the first thing I look at first thing in the morning is going to bum me out or stress me out. And that means no workout. I snap at my kid. We're late for school. I start the day on the wrong foot. I'm stressed all day long and that carries me over into dinner. When you think about the consequences from a long-term perspective, it becomes very clear that it is not just picking up the phone. It is this self-boundary has the power to transform my entire day. And then it becomes easier to hold. Yeah, I've heard specifically with that scenario, I've heard that, and we've even talked about it on this show, that the morning is the rudder of the day. It directs your entire day. That is absolutely true. And phones and technology have proven the most difficult and the most draining in terms of our willpower. So I think about how do I set myself up for success with this boundary? And for a long time in the morning, When I set this boundary and I'm so habitually accustomed to rolling over and checking my phone, I started charging my phone in a different room. So it wasn't there in the morning. So I roll over, reach for my phone. It wasn't there. And I go, oh, okay, phone's not there. Why isn't it there? Because I don't want to check it in the morning. Why don't I want to check it? Because of all of these X, Y, Z reasons. What do I get to do with my day now? And that's how you can automate a boundary with yourself. Make it as difficult as possible to do the behavior you don't want to, or as easy as possible to uphold the boundary with yourself and set yourself up for success. But we're tenacious. So we overcome those boundaries (laughs) and we can even be some of the worst boundary breakers in our lives. How do we, with clear and kind language, talk to ourselves about our own personal boundaries? Yes. You know, I think what can happen is if we impose artificial consequences on ourselves for the boundary break, maybe if I'm going to work out three mornings a week, and if I skip, I'm going to put $20 in a jar. Well, first of all, that starts to feel punitive now, and nobody likes to feel like they're punishing themselves. Second of all, that disconnects the consequences of what happens when I don't work out, what happens when I don't keep my promise to myself. It's not really about the workout. It is about I am looking inward and saying, for my highest good, this is a behavior that I know would serve me. And when I choose not to do that, when I choose to disappoint myself, here are the consequences to that. Here are the consequences in terms of my relationship with myself and how I feel about myself. Here's how it impacts my mental health. Here's how it impacts my physical health. So I think this idea of self-awareness and Yes. Could I easily get up from my bed, walk into the kitchen and pick up my phone to look at it? Sure, I could. But the pause that I had in that moment of reaching for my phone and realizing it's not there, that pause is the cue for me to say, why isn't the phone in the bedroom? Oh, I know why. What happens when I look at my phone in the morning? Oh, I know what can happen. What could I do if I hold this boundary? That all happens in an instant. But giving yourself the moment to self-reflect is a very graceful way to say, okay, I know I have this habit. I know I'm trying to break it. I know it might be challenging, but I'm going to build things into my day to help me say, oh, I remember why I'm doing this and I'm worth doing. Interesting. Now, I know that also in the book, you've got scripts, language that you can use with others as well as yourself. What are some examples of that? Oh, yeah. I have more than 130 scripts. Like I said, for exactly how to set the boundary. So I think I want to, you know, read a lot of articles about boundaries and and have done all my research. You know, they'll talk about the power of boundaries and who you could set boundaries with, but they never really told me how to say them. And that was something that I think my community was really missing. So for example, you're out at a bar, you're not drinking right now for whatever reason. Maybe you're exploring sobriety or your relationship with alcohol. Maybe you're doing a whole 30 or dry January, and somebody is pressuring you to have a drink. What do I say? It sounds like a simple equation, but in the moment, people feel really nervous and really uncomfortable. So I give you scripts. No, thank you. That's your first script. Clear, kind, simple. That's what I call a green level boundary, your entry level. If the person presses, oh, like, are you sure you don't want one? Then you can maybe escalate to a more firm language, a yellow boundary, which is no thanks, I'm not drinking right now. That's a little more clear and a little more direct. 
If they continue to press, now you're at a red level boundary. And a red level is essentially, this is the action that I am going to take in the face of pressure to keep myself safe and healthy. So the red level would be, you've asked me twice and I've said no. I'm going to go talk to Jeff now. And you remove yourself from that situation. That is the consequence of their disrespect of continuing to push. It sounds simple. And you think to yourself, maybe, well, if you don't want to drink, why wouldn't you just say no? I mean, that's a very simple, I think, scenario. But people really struggle with what to say. And because boundaries are a practice, I wanted to give them scripts that they could literally copy and paste. Practice them in your shower. Practice them in the car. Practice saying, I'm not a hugger. I prefer to shake hands until it feels so natural that in the moment it just rolled off your tongue. Now, I love that you brought up the color coding there. And in in that scenario, it is a personal boundary, but it's playing out in public, interacting with other people. So that's a almost a cross between a relationship with others and a relationship with yourself. How do you use the color system when it comes to one that's purely personal and private? So my color coded system, green, yellow, red, is really based on the framework of like minimum effort, maximum effect. I want you to be able to go in with the gentlest, kindest boundary and still have that boundary be respected. That would be like the win-win situation. I used the gentlest, clear, kind language. And that person said, yep, I got you. And now the boundary is in place and you're good to go. I do provide you with yellow and red scripts in case you need to escalate in the face of pushback or people who forget or people who are just determined to disrespect your limit. Those work well in relationship with other people. But when I'm talking about a self-boundary, I don't provide green, yellow, red scripts because I'm only talking to myself. I don't want my language to escalate. I don't want to have to say in the most direct way, you know, and I don't even know what that would look like. I'm not going to check my phone in the morning. I don't even know what it would look like to escalate that language. If you check your phone in the morning, you're a dumb, Melissa. That's not very kind. So I use a different framework with self-boundaries where I really have people explore what are the risks if I don't hold this boundary and what are the freedoms that come if I do. So it's a slightly different framework for self-boundaries. Sounds like this is a, a good connection point for another person that's been on the show, John Acuff and his book Soundtracks, where it's all about that inner dialogue and learning how to create your own playlists instead of listening to the ones that others have told you your whole life. Yes, I love that analogy, because really, if we think about it, the pre-step before identifying that a boundary is needed is looking inwards and saying, what are my needs? Because if you have porous boundaries or no boundaries at all, your entire behavior, your whole life is dictated by what other people need from you. And instead, what I'm asking you to do in this practice is look inward and say, what do I need to feel safe, to feel healthy, to feel like I have more capacity, to feel like my physical space is protected, to feel like my finances are protected, to make this relationship better? And that's a really important and often, I think, overlooked step in the boundary practice. And it's not something that especially women are trained or conditioned or even encouraged to do. Now, I know there's one other piece here in terms of personal boundaries, and this predates the book. And even to a certain extent, well, it kind of goes hand in hand with Whole30. But I know that you gave up caffeine more than 10 years ago. How would you retroactively have worked on that? It probably contributed to this book and to this methodology. Share a little bit about your story with that. Yeah. So I gave up counseling in all forms. Oh, I mean, more than a decade ago after several people in my life gently pointed out that maybe my caffeine habit was not serving me. It was a really busy time in Whole30 land that we had just taken the business. You know, I quit my old job and tried to take Whole30 full time. We were traveling a ton and I was really propping up my energy levels with caffeine. But it made me really cranky, really anxious, irritable, and it seemed to last forever. Some people I knew could have a coffee after dinner and go straight to sleep, and I was wired for hours. So I decided to do a little caffeine test, and I gave it up for 30 days and reintroduced it, Whole30 style, and the reintroduction went terribly. And that was the point where I was like, this is not serving me. And as hard as it was to give it up, and as much as I missed it, and I had to find other routines to replace you know, a warm cup of coffee in the morning, I really did think about what is at risk if I go back to this? 
It's going to make me irritable. It's going to make me anxious. It's going to make me just not pleasant to be around. My habit is going to creep. I feel physically awful when I drink it. And what are the freedoms that it brings me if I don't drink caffeine? I will be free to not be like that all day long. And I'll be free to find other ways to boost my energy and productivity in ways that just feel far healthier for me. I have gone back to it. I did go back to caffeine as like a little trial a couple years ago. And it went just as terribly. It was just as awful, just as quick. And I quickly gave it back up and said, okay, all right, we tried it. I mean, you thought I could handle it better this time around and I couldn't. And now, you know, it's just relatively effortless. I have built into my life other things that help me focus and help keep me energized such that I don't really need caffeine anymore. See, and that's the lesson on Whole30 as well as boundaries is you put something in place, you go without it, you assess it. The word you used earlier was experiment, and that's exactly what it was. And and when you gave yourself permission to go back to it, you quickly realized, oh, yeah, no, there is a reason. And you came up with other alternatives to get as well as maintain and sustain energy, which caffeine doesn't really give you energy. It does. Anyway, I'm not going to even start yeah. to go down the chemical <laughs> rabbit hole there, but it can be very time consuming. Yeah. And, you know, at first I did have to set a boundary with myself. No matter what, you are not going to drink coffee. So I would be out at breakfast with friends and everyone would order their coffee and I would have my sad, cold ice water in front of me. And it sucked. It was miserable. And I was like, oh, this is so hard. But I had a boundary with myself that I wouldn't. And I quickly realized, okay, what else could I do? I could bring my own packet of herbal tea and ask for a cup of hot water, and I could still have a cup of something warm that didn't have caffeine. Eventually, I started drinking decaf coffee, and I realized that even though decaf has a little caffeine, I can still handle it. I found coffee alternatives. So I found quickly ways to replace that habit and the association such that I didn't really need to maintain a super strict boundary with myself because now it was automatic. But it all started, as many habits do, with a boundary with myself. I want to point people to where they can find out more about the book, more about you and all the things that you're doing. If they're not already convinced, which I think most people should be, to dig into the book, where can they go to find out more? Yeah, the book of boundaries, the published date is or was October 11th, depending on when this comes out. And you can find it anywhere that books are sold. My website is melissau.com. And my Instagram is the same, at melissau. And that's where I talk about all kinds of things from boundaries to relationships to addiction and recovery to self-help, everything tangential to and in support of healthy boundaries. And I hear that even if it's not at the time of this dropping, you have a podcast that has episodes out, but is going to be renewed, <laughs> reborn, come back, in other words. Maybe. You know, that's <laughs> one of the things where it's like, I really want to start the podcast again, but I have to be able to do it in a way that is sustainable. And I haven't quite figured out what that looks like and definitely can't do it while I'm on book tour. I do have several events across the U.S. and Canada, but maybe in the new year, I'll take a look and figure out how I could reboot the podcast in a way that works for my schedule. And in the meantime, people can go check out all the past episodes and absolutely keep busy till you do, because I think you will. I mean, the podcasting bug, once you have it, you kind of think, oh, man, I've got to go back to it. So I know it's true. <laughs> well, Melissa, it's been great talking with you. I am so glad to have had you here. Thank you so much for sharing all about the Book of Boundaries. My pleasure. Thanks for the conversation, Eric. Well, that's another podcast crossed off your listening to-do list. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Melissa Urban like I did. Once again, you can find everything we talked about in the show notes for this episode at beyondthetodolist.com. That's also where you can do me the favor of hitting the share button in your podcast player app of choice or again over at those show notes to share this episode with someone I know you know needs to hear it. Would you do me that favor? Do Melissa that favor? Do that friend that favor of sharing this episode with them? You can also find select episodes of Beyond the To-Do List on Blinkist as shortcasts, seven to 10 minute episodes, quick and easy to the point, potent productivity shots in the arm for you. You can find those at beyondthetodolist.com slash Blinkist. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you again for listening, and I will see you next episode.